and the man who needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. It's Duncan Stewart, presenter of RTE's ECOI. Thank you, Helen, and thank you, Minister Finbar, all the team, Brendan. You know, I must say this initiative is really important and the credit unions are the right people to be doing it. So committed to their local areas and, you know, so close to what people, to their, who their customers are, who their members are, etc. So I'm, I'm very committed to credit unions and this is a really important initiative. So I'm very pleased to be asked to give a talk here about climate change. And, you know, where do I start? Because I think we all understand now that climate change is the greatest existential challenge that civilization has ever had to face. We have created this problem because of our greenhouse gas emissions. We've now got to a situation where the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere are now at 415 parts per million. If you put that in context, that's 50% above the highest it has been for over 800,000 years and the highest in three to possibly four million years. So we're in a situation of, of a species that are out of control with our greenhouse gas emissions. We've altered the chemical composition of the atmosphere. We have altered the oceans in terms of their temperature and in their terms of their acidification of the water caused by our greenhouse gas emissions. And we have altered the biosphere for all living species. So we're heading into what is called the Anthropocene. We're probably in it now, which will be the sixth mass extinction of species. The last time the rate of loss of species happened was 55 million years ago. That's the rate that's happening now today on this planet. We've lost already in the last 50 years, we've lost two thirds of the populations of wildlife and 80% of insects. This is shocking. In our time, in our watch, this has happened. And climate change, change is exacerbating the loss of species. But climate change is the greatest existential challenge to all of us, and especially to our younger generation. And I'm talking about not just children, I'm talking about people under 50. You know, by, if we look at over the next 30 years, what's coming down the track with climate change, unless we make massive changes, fundamental changes in our greenhouse gas emissions, we are heading for massive problems. As we get into the, 20, the second half of this century, you know, the problems will get completely out of control and will be irreversible and, and basically runaway climate change is what will happen unless we attack this now. This is happening very late. We should have done this 30 years ago. We knew the science was there. We understood the issues. The, the, in other words, the, it was very firm at that stage what the science was, but for whatever reason, society ignored the facts and governments ignored the facts across the world. So we have this challenge now, and we have basically eight years to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions down from what it is now to at least 45% of a reduction over that time. That's the global need. The United Nations yesterday informed us that, uh, in, or sorry, in, on Tuesday, in, in, in their recent report of if the, the trajectory now we're on for COP26 as uh, the minister just mentioned, the, the NDC's commitments by governments will actually only bring us down by 7.5% reduction by 2030. So what's going to come out of COP26, unless changes happen there, we are facing massive problems because a 7.5% will cause us to exceed two degrees, which were into dangerous climate change. So what's going to happen in COP26 really failed in 2015, in COP15 in Copenhagen, where governments, especially the US, 
basically did not commit and effectively everybody kind of, it, the whole thing fell apart. And of course there was a big false climate change scandal in the media at the time, which discredited the whole science by vested interest groups that were infiltrating the media. So we, we know what's going on out there of vested interests basically pushing their agenda. And I'm talking about the fossil fuel industry, etc. So we look at climate change and we look at, you know, where we are in terms of what's happening. Well, the EU has made a commitment of a 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. That actually is not good enough, but it is a big step forward and it's a big challenge. Now that 55% reduction is from 1990 levels. <clears throat> and Ireland's emissions in that time, since 1990, increased by 10 to 13% in, 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 in our greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors. Agriculture, energy related CO2 for transport, heat and power, cement, waste, these sort of issues were, are what comprises are accounted for emissions. But in that time, Ireland's emissions went up by 10 to 13 percent across Europe. And at that time, UK was part of the EU. And then, then take Norway and Switzerland along with that group. Altogether, the collective reductions in Europe by, from 1990 to 2020 was a 25% reduction. But Ireland's emissions went the other way. And our emissions now are over 50% above the European average in greenhouse gas emissions. It's shocking. We're the laggards. We have to understand that we are a major part of the problem. And we can't be saying that we can, oh, well, we're a small country, we don't matter. Every small area, every city, every small region can say the same thing. We're in this together. We have one climate system. We have one atmosphere. And our greenhouse gas emissions are massively affecting uh, this, our atmosphere and then our oceans, and then our cryosphere. In other words, our ice regions melting at a rate now six times what they were 30 years ago. That's the rate of melt of ice on this planet now. It's all shocking. There's nothing I can say that's positive about this because it's really difficult. I will come into the positive sides later in my talk when we come to the solutions. But we have to make that something we understand because we want our children to have a future. We have to collectively all engage in this and there's no room for laggards or free riders. We have to all realize that we all have to make this commitment and we need strong go government policy to drive this. And I'm hoping, and I'm hoping really strongly that the the um, Climate Action Plan will be strong enough this time to effectively deliver the changes that are required. The last Climate Action Plan failed, failed very badly and had to be reformed. So we're waiting for this to come out. It was meant to come out last month or by the end of this month. I don't know whether, or maybe the minister might be able to inform us of that. And by the way, thank you, minister, for your comments. I really appreciate your commitment to this. You seem to be incredibly sincere about it. And it's great to see you staying on and listening. And, uh, you know, I really want to see more of our ministers taking the issue of climate change really seriously and not putting a spin on it or not giving us a greenwash approach to the problem. Our citizens deserve to be treated honestly by politicians. And they, 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 we need to understand that we don't want to look back in 20 years time and feel that we were dis dis misinformed or basically cheated in, in this situation. It's very difficult for politicians. I understand that because doing something painful is, is difficult. You know, it's not easy for politicians to, to go up against the status quo who really just want to get on with their life as it is and deal with issues that they are. So it's not an easy thing. So I'm not trying to... In, in any way blame politicians for this because we as a society are the ones that elect our politicians 
and it's really based on what their objectives are, what their needs are, politicians respond to. So we need to understand that this is the, this we have to deal with this issue fundamentally. And it's great to see that what Gratify are doing, that is going to make a massive change across the country. And if we look at our emissions across different sectors, agriculture is now 35% of overall greenhouse gas emissions. Transport is, is 30, well, it's 23% of our overall greenhouse gas emissions, but it's 39% of our energy related CO2, followed by um, heat in our buildings, which is where we're talking about now, heating our buildings. That's 34% of our energy related CO2. And then power generation is coming down because of the amount of wind energy that's out there now. That has come down to 27% from what it was maybe five years ago at 34%. So power generation is coming down, it's becoming more less carbon intensive because of wind energy and because we're closing down peat plants, etc., and other power generating plants from fossil fuels. But we need to look at the heat sector because that's really important to us. Because when we look at across those sectors anyway, you have transport, heat and power, then you have cement, which is another 6% of our greenhouse gas emissions. That's because of that from, from it, when you go into the manufacture of cement to turn it into concrete. And when it comes to buildings and new buildings, the average house where built of concrete will generate about 40 tonnes of CO2 in embodied carbon. That's a really shocking figure. And I think we need to understand that every time we build something new, every time we buy a new car, for example, the embodied carbon that goes into the manufacture is very, very high. The average car in Ireland, new car sold in Ireland, the embodied carbon from the manufacture of those cars is about 17 tonnes of CO2, just to put it in context. That's the average car. It ranges from about six tonnes for a small car, light car, to about 35 tonnes for an SUV, a large SUV. And this is a shocking amount of carbon emissions that are being dumped into the atmosphere freely. And I think we need to realise where these problems are coming from. You know, a lot of these buildings, most of these buildings could be built of timber, which stores carbon out of the atmosphere. It sequesters it. It basically, in the process of the forest, through, through photosynthesis, it absorbs carbon, all plants absorb carbon, but trees store it in their timber. And it's so important that what has been done in the forest in sequestering carbon continues after the trees have been have been removed and they continue they hold that carbon indefinitely into the future and no better way than in building in doing this in buildings so really we have to reduce our concrete massively and it's it's all these are all things that we have to understand that if we are going to face dealing with climate change we have to look at the holistic look at this and it's not just the burning of the emissions here in Ireland. We have to look at the life cycle analysis of all of these uh, fuels, fossil fuels, oil, gas, coal and peat over their full life cycle in terms of their, their, their emissions from the extraction to the refining of oil and gas to, you know, same with coal, right through its life cycle. So when we look anyway at, at these emissions, and we look at our homes, two thirds of our heating is used in our homes in Ireland. So it's a massive part. 26% of all of our energy related CO2 is, is generated in our homes, where again, two thirds of that roughly is in heat energy, especially for, for space heating. And the other third is for hot water, power generation and lighting from elect use of electricity. So if we kind of understand that space heating is the biggest chunk of this, now that varies quite dramatically from one house to another. The bigger the house, the bigger the amount of carbon emissions, the more, um, the, 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 
the, the higher the better performance in terms of building energy ratings for example the bet the, the the better the difference between say for example an a1 house which is less than 25 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum that's an a1 house or a b a b b a b2 a b a, a, a sorry an, an a2 which is less than 50 kilowatt hours and on and down but if we get to g rating it starts at 450 and goes as far as 1100 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum. So G rating houses are impossible to heat, really. You cannot, you know, the amount of energy. It's the same as, for example, if I talk about a passive house, it's what we should all be building for new buildings today. Any extension to our houses, any new building should be to the passive house standards of Europe, which were set up in Germany, which basically means that all houses will have a performance of less than 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum. And that's the level that we should be building all our new buildings to. You know, if you think of it relative to a G rating house, a passive house will first of all deliver what it says on the tin because it's an engineered solution and it's, it's all calculated in every way. So it, it compares massively to say an A1 because an A2, an A1 has a BER of less than 25, but that could vary massively depending on how it was constructed. You know, there's a lot of parameters there for variation, whereas the passive house will deliver. But then you compare that to say a G-rated house, you could build 30 to 70 passive houses with the same energy consumption as a one G-rated house. That's the comparison. So I think we have to understand that that's the level and it doesn't really cost that much more to do it. And certainly the savings you will make over the next five, 10 years by building to passive house standards will pay off. So what I'm saying when it comes to retrofitting our homes, it's much more difficult to achieve this. And when I look at our homes today, our homes are between 60 and 80% higher in CO2 emissions than the average home in Europe. So we have a big challenge. We need to see this. We have a great opportunity with the 500,000 houses that the minister has mentioned there over the next eight years to retrofit. The, the possible cost of that will be in the order of 25 billion to do this. Obviously, some of that will come from householders in terms of their savings. Some will come from, from uh, grants, hopefully from government that will back this up or other incentives from government. And the third one obviously is come, will come from loans like what is, we're talking about here with Gratify. So this is a wonderful opportunity, but remember those 500,000 houses are only a quarter of our building stock, our housing stock. So it's not going to solve everything, but at least let us get this done let us achieve this. Let us not be the laggards of Europe. Let us reap the benefits of the, of the energy performance of these buildings and the comfort. And, and it's not just the CO2 reductions and the higher value it will place on our homes. Because over the next five years, we will see huge differences in the, in the property value when it comes to a house that is going to be sold at, say, a passive house standard or even an A1 standard compared to, uh, say, a D standard, which is the average house today, which because people will understand the amount of benefits and the amount of cost that will go in to retrofitting when they go to buy a house. So I, I, I feel we're on a cusp of something really special. And I think Finbar mentioned there the importance of the local. You know, there's so many people that can benefit locally from this. I mean, contractors, tradesmen, all of these. An example would be that every million spent on retrofit generates about 19 full-time rewarding jobs per year. And if you use that, that metric, you know, and look at how much, for example, a building society will be putting out in loans and you convert that into jobs, 19 jobs for every million investment is very sizable in terms of employment benefits. But the employment needs to be 
so many tradesmen out there that need upskilling and so many <clears throat> in the just transition workers that are now having to leave fossil fuel because we have to understand that fossil fuel industries are going to collapse over the next 10 years. We will see massive uh, default across fossil fuel industries. We're now in a situation where we're seeing fossil fuels rising again to very high levels globally in terms of oil and gas. We're coming to the end of a fossil fuel era. And what's going to happen now, if you look at Horizon 2020, uh, we, and you look at say the European Green Deal and all these initiatives, one trillion investment there waiting to go into green energy solutions from Europe. It's clear that there's only one way to go and that's this route of greening.